friends, or both. I hope it was a good holiday for you. Hey, I'm going to kick us off with a few announcements. I'm going to get out of the way and we're going to worship together. Let me tell you about some things that are going on at Adams that are coming up. We've just come through a crazy busy season. Uh, and so you can look at your focus. You'll notice that compared to December, January is a bit of a lull. That's because we believe in Sabbath. And we could all just like to go. <sighs> um, but. We have a big thing happening next Sunday, and that's that our, our Bible classes are swapping over. We got a new quarter change, which means we have some new uh, options that I hope that you will plug into. So let me tell you what's coming up, and you can read it for yourself. But in, uh, in, our, in our first Bible class here upstairs, we have the book of Jonah. Uh, the book of Jonah is a, a super interesting book. It is about way more than some dude and a fish. Um, it, is, it is incredibly deep, and Brent Taylor is going to be leading us through that. I highly recommend. Uh, if you want a good textual deep dive, Jonah's the class for you. Rick Tucker uh, is a crazy person, and I know that he's crazy because he accepted a crazy idea that I pitched to him a while ago. I said, what if we had a class on the book of Maccabees? And he's like, I'll do it. Book of Maccabees happens in that 400-year period between the last page of your Old Testament and the first page of your New and that time when we were all taught like, and then there was silence for 400 years. Um, no. So he's going to be teaching through the book of Maccabees, explaining how the world got to the way the world was when Jesus showed up. A lot happened in those four centuries. That's what Maccabees covers. So he'll be in our second upstairs adult Bible classroom. And then downstairs, Lauren and I are going to be walking through the Enneagram with those who would like to go through it. The Enneagram is um, a, a personality tool that helps you understand yourself and your loved ones better. If you want help working on your relationship with you, your relationship with your spouse, it's no... Um, no exaggeration to say that this tool transformed our marriage, transformed our interactions with our children, with our parents. Uh, the application is infinite. So we're going to spend about 12 weeks going through and, and learning together more about ourselves um, and, and, uh, and who God has created us to be. All right, enough about that. Let's celebrate something cool. This Wednesday was Christmas. And on Christmas, our church hosts the Friends Indeed Lunch. We have a lot of people show up to serve and to participate and eat together. It's a, re a really neat thing that blesses our community. Uh, and while we were doing it, uh, Channel 6 showed up and the little spot on it. I don't know if you got to see it, but I want you to see it. So we're going to show real quick that clip that, uh, that Channel 6 showed about the Friends Indeed Lunch. And we're going to hope that we don't get any ads when we pull this up. Otherwise, we may have a sponsored worship service this morning. From commercial property to an entire building's identity, a key element for lasting impressions. Providing the perfect solution at your business, school, or property. All signs. Let's grow your business together. Hundreds of people poured into a Bartlesville church today for the 17th annual Friends Indeed Christmas lunch. Let's turn that up the a bit. The organizers prepared food for days and say because of their preparation, they never run out. News on 6 is Taylor Newcomb with the story. This Christmas lunch has been a Bartlesville tradition for 17 years, but if the people who host the lunch have anything to say about it, they say it'll last forever. What do you need? Volunteers call her the queen of the kitchen. Rita McDonald has cooked Christmas lunch for the Bartlesville community for almost two decades, and she's got it down to an art. We come in early, like 6 o'clock in the morning. From turkey to corn to mashed potatoes, Rita makes it all, preparing to feed the masses. It started off maybe a couple hundred people the first year and grew to close to a thousand people the last couple of years. Close to a hundred people volunteer every year. Even Oklahoma's own Joseph Holloway was there. Organizers say this is no cafeteria meal. Once a year, every year, they open up the most festive restaurant in town. The people come in, are seated, and the servers go get the food for them and we serve it on real china, not on paper plates. George Halkiitis has been here since the beginning, 17 years ago. It slowly increases every year. We're hoping one time we'll get up to 1,000. 
They keep track of how many people show up by counting the plates. But even more important than the numbers are the smiles this community meal brings to the table. We want to continue this forever. As long as there are people that are home alone, you know, we want them to be able to have a meal and have a good time and enjoy it. Helping people is our goal. Serving people. In Bartlesville, Taylor Newcomb, Oklahoma Zone, News on 6. I saw a lot of you in those shots. Hey, if you're visiting with us, welcome. Can I tell you the thing that you need to know that that video shows you probably better than anything I can say? Our church is on a journey to love, share, and serve like Jesus did. On Christmas, that means we show up and serve. When a ramp needs to get built, it means we show up and serve. When a friend's in need, we show up and we serve because we want to be like Jesus. Let's stand, say hi to the person next to you, and then let's worship God together this morning.
Father in heaven, we thank you. Words cannot adequately express how much we thank you for being our Father, for being our God, for being our Savior. And we ask the Father that you would help us to remember that as we go through this week and as we go through this worship this morning, Father, help us to lift your name in praise, in song, in prayer, and allow each of us to allow you to fill us with your spirit, with your wisdom, and with your patience, with your kindness with your love for us and for each other and for the world around us. Be with us, Father, as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> No! 
care unit because of his Alzheimer's. He doesn't remember the farm anymore. And most of the time, he doesn't remember mom, even though he loved her dearly for over 60 years. Memories are precious. I have many, many, many memories of living and working that land with my mom, dad, and sister. The, the experience I had and the lessons I learned in those years had a big part of making me who I am. You know exactly what I'm talking about because you have your own memories. You have the things in your mind that shaped you into who you've become. Some are precious, some are painful. But because we remember these things, we are grounded. Through these memories, we have our identity. When those memories fail, it gets harder and harder to know who we are. If those memories fail completely, much of who we are goes away. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul tells the church at Corinth his memories of what Jesus said that last night before he died as he broke the bread and passed the cup. The NIV says, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The message version says, do this to remember me. Take this time to remember Jesus and what he did for you. If we don't think about him and his sacrifice, it becomes easy for, to forget who he is and who we are. We can drift away and forget. Forget we are sons and daughters of God. Forget our brother Jesus gave up his life so we can have this life now and live in heaven with him and God after this life is over. Each time we do this, we proclaim who Jesus is and what he did for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving us enough to send him down here. And thank, you. thank Jesus for being willing to come down here and not hold to his throne and not hold to his glory, but to give himself on the cross that we can have life, life with you. As we partake of this bread, we remember his body given and sacrificed for our lives. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Father, as we continue this memorial, we think of Jesus on the cross. We think of Jesus being flogged. We think of his blood being spilled, taken from him, 
his life being taken from him. We think of his willingness to obey your love, even to this earthly death. And we thank you, Father, for his sacrifice. And we thank you, Father, that you did not leave him in the grave. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. At this time, we want to remember the other gifts of God. Let's pray. Father, you are so generous. If we gave you our entire life, all that we have and all that we can acquire, we couldn't doubt give you. Thank you, Father, for the material blessings of this world. And thank you, Father, for health, strength, time. Help us to be generous with all of these that we may be able to walk this earth and show your love to others. Help us, Father, to give with a cheerful heart and an open hand. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we can dismiss our two-year-olds through first grade to Children's Church. And there's worship notes in the back for the second through sixth graders. If you'd like, let's stand and sing before the lesson. Holy words, long preserved for our
Well, again, good morning to you. With it being the holidays, we have a lot of folks out of town and a lot of folks in town visiting, I can see. And we are glad that you joined us this morning. Um, if you would, and I should have said this at the beginning, but I always forget. If you want to let us know that you were here, um, you can do that on one of those cards. But I'll tell you what, if you're from out of town, we're just glad to have you. Um, but if you are in town and looking for a new church home, can I get you to stick around long enough for us to meet you? After we're done, let us shake your hand, say hi to you, and get to know you a little bit. Uh, find out what makes you tick and how our church can be a part of your spiritual journey. Now, I hope that you had a, a great Christmas. I got to tell you, we had a wonderful one. It's so fun to watch the kids enjoy their presence and then come and serve here at the Friends Indeed lunch. Um, and then on Thursday, Lauren and the kids left and went to Florida, which I'm not going to say is a Christmas present for me. And with Lauren and the kids being out of town, um, on the off chance that she's watching, I've been cleaning all weekend. (laughs) And me and Jesus will talk about that later. (laughs) So we have moved out of our Advent season, and we've got a couple of weeks before uh, our our 2020 theme and series and all that kicks off. So we're going to have a couple of of weeks along the way where we do... uh, one-offs and where we just talk about some kind of topical things. So I'd like to invite you to open to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to get there in just a minute. At Christmas time, we sing, Tis the season to be jolly, fa la 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 And then we get through that and we move into, Tis the season for resolutions. And then in two weeks... Is the season to break those resolutions. Fa la 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 la. We used to joke when I was a body pump instructor that the, you would see this massive surge of new people for the first two weeks of every new year. All of a sudden, everybody would show up at the Y. Everybody was excited about getting in shape, about doing body pump. They were really going to be committed. And then in about two weeks, you were back to where you had been two weeks before Christmas. You know, it's the end of 2019 the end of the year. How did those resolutions go for you last year? Are you thinner? Are you going to bed earlier? Are you reading more? I mean, those are just the resolutions I broke. Are you happier? Did you accomplish what you set out to accomplish? And really, that's not even the question. At the end of 2019, looking back, are you the person that you wanted to become at the beginning of 2019? And let's put it in bigger perspective, actually, because this is also the end of a decade. At the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, are you the person you wanted to become at the beginning of 2010? Now, my guess is the answer is, eh, sort of. I mean, in some ways, maybe it's been a good year or a good decade, but in a lot of ways, maybe we're right where we were. There was this meme I saw on Facebook a week or so ago that said, uh, to all of the people who read my college essays that asked where I saw myself in five years, I apologize for being so overly optimistic. (laughs) The crunch about this question, honestly, I don't care how you did on your New Year's resolutions. I don't care if you lost weight or you slept more, you read more books. Like Maybe you succeeded, maybe you didn't. But the the, the crunch time for us comes when we start asking about the kind of person that we wanted to be in our discipleship following Jesus Christ. I know when uh, working with teenagers, we used to talk a lot about their frustration when we'd have like the camp or the retreat and you'd come back with the spiritual high. And they're like, oh, I'm so on fire. And then two weeks later, where were we? Back in the valley. What happened to all of that? And, and maybe, uh, maybe that's where you are. But what I've learned working with adults is that we very rarely now talk about the highs and the lows because we don't really have the highs. For a lot of us adults, what happens is we, we go from peaks and valleys to just kind of this plateau of busyness and distractedness and overcommittedness. And so we seem to get lost in the daily grind. Here's the big question I want us to wrestle with this morning. As we head into 2020, how do we become the people God wants us to be? That's what is at the heart of our church. 
being disciples and making disciples. And being a disciple means being a student or a follower of Jesus. How do we become the kind of people that Jesus would have us be? In Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 18, you see Jesus calling his disciples. And it says this. It says, One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus came out or called out to them, say the bold part with me. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets and they followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them too. They, say it with me, immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind See, Jesus' call starts the way that so many stories in the Bible starts, with a calling from God and a chance to respond. As we ask the question of how do we become in 2020 and beyond the kind of person that God would have us to be, how do we become the kind of people Jesus wants to shape us into, I would say that we have to go back to the beginning and start here to acknowledge that Jesus is calling you. Jesus doesn't call you once. Jesus calls you to be a disciple, which is ultimately calling you to say yes over and over again. If you're going to grow in 2020, if you're going to become more of the person God is calling to, I want to encourage you that you've got to start saying yes to Jesus. Now you're saying, but I've already done that. I mean, I put my faith in Jesus. I got baptized. I show up at church. I've already said yes to Jesus. But let me ask you this question. When's the last time that you've answered God's call to adventure? Because when Jesus calls and says, come be my disciple, he doesn't say, come and go to temple with me regularly. He says, come and follow me. Join in this journey. Join in this adventure with me. When is the last time that your faith called you to step out and take a risk? When is the last time you've looked back and said that following Jesus changed me and led me into uncharted territory? Part of the reason that it feels like for so many of us that we plateau or that that we don't really move anymore is because our saying yes, the last time we really said yes, happened a while ago. And we've been cruising in the lane that God called us to then. In 2020, what would it look like to say yes to Jesus again? Not in faith for the first time, but in faithfulness again and again and again. If you want to grow this year with Jesus, say yes again. Step into the adventure. Take a risk in the name of faith. One of the things that we talked about a lot in youth ministry was that if you want teens to grow, you have to put them in a place of crisis. That explains a lot of the activities we did now that I think about it. If you want teens to grow, you put them in a place of crisis, a manufactured crisis. We're not talking about making them unsafe, but you put them in a place where they have to either step up and succeed and grow into the challenge or retreat from it and shrink and stay where they were. That's not just true for teenagers. If you want to grow in your discipleship, if you want to become more like Jesus, you need to step out in a risk. Put yourself in that place where you might just fail and grow into the opportunity, choosing not to shrink away from the challenge. Say yes to the adventure. Number two, if you want to grow in 2020, stop setting goals. All right, all my administrative types in here just freaked out a little bit. Wait, you're saying don't overplan the calendar? You're saying don't write things down? Don't make a checklist? I'm not not saying that. Stop setting goals and start making habits. And here's the thing about human behavior. We're told at this time of year, make a new resolution, set a new goal for yourself. But how often does that work for most of us? Again, just check your waistline. Not nearly as often as we would like because because goals are something that sound really good, but if you don't change habitual behavior, your goals always fail. Now, if you're a goal planner and you like succeeding and you're good at that, go for it. Ignore this part of the lesson. But for the rest of us, hear this. If you want to become more like Jesus in 2020, say yes to the adventure, and then instead of setting goals to do all the lofty things you've never gotten around to, 
Let's start changing our habits. It's interesting if you look in your Bibles, I'm not going to put this on the screen because we're not going to read the whole thing, but if you have a physical Bible and, or even a digital one, you can flip over. When you move from when Jesus calls the disciples, it moves from chapter 4 to chapter 5, and chapter 5 is what? Look in your Bible. What does chapter 5 start? The Sermon on the Mount. Now, how do we get the Sermon on the Mount? The Sermon on the Mount was not a one-time sermon that Jesus gave that Peter just happened to be, okay, Peter would have never been the one with pen and paper. Um, Levi, the tax collector, he may have taken notes. Levi was not sitting to the side dictating what Jesus said. The way we got the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus preached this sermon over and over and over again. Jesus' invitation to adventure, come follow me, very quickly turned into an invitation to listen to the same set of teachings repeatedly until the disciples learned them by heart. The disciples grew to be like Jesus, not by saying yes once and then magically arriving, but by hearing this habitual lesson. This is the way the world works in the kingdom of God. And then for two, cha- two and a half chapters of your Bible, Jesus teaches. They heard it ad nauseum. You have to think at some point they showed up to one of Jesus' rallies and went, man, I really thought he'd have new material by now. Jesus wasn't working on goals with them. He was creating habits. Jesus does something else here that I think is instructive for us. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes the big idea that he's trying to create, the big goal, be like God. Be holy because I am holy. He takes that big goal and then he breaks it down into its smaller parts, into its constituent parts. And he teaches them how to do each step of the process. Okay, that that sounds good. Let's make it super, super practical. Um, I asked Ava Parham if she would help me with something real quick. Because I want to show you what this looks like. Ava, can you join me up here for just a second? Now, I know it's basketball season. But Ava's also, she's a multi-sport athlete. And she plays softball. Yeah? How many years? Where's it? Here. How many years have you played softball for? How many years have you played softball for? One. One. She's an old pro. And I bet you learned a lot. This is Ladybugs. That's like the best team name ever. Um, I bet that you learned a lot of new things this season, didn't you? Had you ever like thrown the ball before? A little bit? Who'd you throw the ball with before it started? With your dad? Okay, so your dad took it. Lane, you took her out and played catch with her a little bit. Got her prepared. Okay, and your coach said, well, did you coach her team? You did coach her team. Okay, good. You know, come up here too, Lane. I, don't, I didn't ask Lane for this, but you're the one that coached her. Come up here real quick. I'm about to put myself in harm's way. You're the one that coached her. I'll let you do it. All right, so, so your dad was your coach. Here, step up here real quick. You got to get away from any collateral damage. Here's what I want you to do. Now, your dad doesn't have a glove, okay? Your dad's going to stand right over there. And I, just, I want you just to kind of... Throw the ball to him. Throw it, not hard, okay, gently, but throw it, because if you throw it hard, he's going to fall in the baptistry. On second thought, throw it hard. No, no, don't. Okay, throw it back. Play a little catch here, okay? Well, I tried to coach my sons to play catch, and I promised they were not half that good when I was done with them. She can catch, and she can throw. Now, I got some good news for you. Your dad did a good job, but I got some bad news for you. Your dad's just an okay coach. I've done you a favor. Are you excited? I got you your own private lesson this morning. Yeah, well, it's like a public lesson, but it's, but it's a, Ryan, come here. Coach Ryan Stouter, everybody. Ryan was a baseball coach for uh, 13 years, something like that. He is an expert. Your dad's good, okay? But, but Ryan's an expert, and I want to take your throwing to the next level. Okay, get, throw the ball back over here, Lane. Ryan, I'm going to give you a mic. Now, I told Ryan he's got two and a half minutes to do this whole lesson. It was four. Well, I'm long-winded, okay? Just real quickly, if you had two and a half minutes to teach Ava to throw the ball at the next level, how would you teach her to throw? No, oh, that's, the, that's the worship leader, Mike. If we can, no, it's okay. Use the mic. People on YouTube want to hear it, too. Oh, that's true. Okay, now you can hear me. Okay, so I say with everybody, when you do anything in sports, you want to have, it starts with your feet, right? So you move your feet. You know, just like you are, you're doing a good job. Now, you know how when you were throwing to your dad, and I know you were just throwing it light because you're just doing this because you didn't want him to fall in the baptistry. 
right? But we're going to work on stepping when we throw first. So the first thing that I want you to work on is a small step with your right foot, and then you turn like that. Ooh, we're stepping. That? How exciting. Ooh, yes. This now is riveting. Front, and when you do it, you can do it with me again. Let's two-step. One, two. And your foot doesn't have to be two sideways. There you go. Now, the purpose of that is to get your weight turned all the way to the side, so now we can get more power in it, and we can knock your dad into the baptistry. So, ooh, yes. All right, now, so when you do the two-step, when you do that, I want you to separate your hands like I do. So you go one, two, separate your hands. Separate your hands. Nice. Good. And we want, when you do it, try it one more time. All right, and we want this arm up right here. We want the back of your shoulder going straight down your elbow right to your dad. Right? Yes. Now, the last step, since I only have very much time, is when you do the step and you separate your hands, separate your hands, I want you to push off your back leg and follow through. Push your shoulders and your like, chin towards your front arm until your chest, your shoulders are over your toes, and then you release and follow through. You all right, that? you got it? Step three. You got the whole lesson. All right, all right. There we all go. Right. And so we want to do it all at once. You ready? I'll Let's show throw you one it to time him. all along. Throw it to your dad this time. Not you, Ryan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, you got this. Step. Yeah. Hey, she got it. Nice. Woo. It's amazing what a pro will do. Yeah. Thank now, you. hey, can we, oh, you got one more well, thing? Well, I got one more thing for her. Well, ooh. So, if, do you want to get really good at this? You have to do it 3,500 times in the next week. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> Thank, let's, hey, can we thank Ryan? Now, now, hold on. Stay here, Ava, for just a second, okay? I want you for one more second, okay? So Ryan just gave you this lesson, okay? And then he said you have to practice 3,500 times. That doesn't mean the whole thing. That means you need to, you need to step twice, 3,500 times. Can you do that? And then you're going to move your... Why not? It's Christmas break. You got plenty of time. Too, too much. It's too much. Let's pause there for a second. Can we thank Ava and Lane for helping us? Thank you. You were awesome. Your dad really did a great job teaching you to throw. 3,500 times. And I say, what is the point of that? Well, some of you are still dreaming of going pro when we wanted to help. But here's the point. To be good at throwing the ball, to be good at, at just that one fundamental part of playing baseball, if you really want to get good, you don't just throw the ball. Because throwing the ball over and over again will work in some bad habits, won't it? If you want to get better, you have to break the motion down into its component elements and practice them over and over and over again. That statement is true about everything in your life that becomes a habit, including the way you follow Jesus. If you want to succeed and to say, I want to be more like Christ, you don't just say it and then it happens. You break it down into its constituent elements and then practice over and over and over again. But what Ava said is incredibly telling. She said, that's too much. And it is too much sometimes, isn't it? It can feel like too much. I would like to fill in the blank to be more like Jesus, but I don't have time but I don't have the energy. But it will require something that I'm not in a place that I want to give. But I don't know why I'm not growing in my faith. Well, I know why, and so do you. If you want to be more like Jesus in 2020, break it down and practice. Now, Ryan asked a really, really good question in our conversation getting ready for this. He said, he said if I'm thinking through the eyes of the, the teens that I'm leading in our youth group, you know, I wonder... All that practice in creating those habits, like isn't that the opposite of relationship? If what I want is relationship with God, what I want is to be a friend of God, then isn't all of that like breaking it down and practicing the components, doesn't that get in the way of relationship? And I know that some of us have, have wrestled with this. When we talk about being more like Jesus, what we want is a feeling of success or closeness. Doesn't the habit get in the way? Now, standing there and throwing the ball over and over and over again, working on each individual part of the motion, that does get boring. But you know what doesn't get boring? Playing catch with your kid. Playing catch with your friend. 
making that perfect play at shortstop where you scoop the ball up and fire one to first base and get the out right before they get to the base. That never gets old. But you don't get there if you don't practice the other stuff. Are you with me? Some of us say, I don't know why my relationship with God isn't better, doesn't feel like it used to, doesn't feel more in depth, isn't going anywhere. And I would say, because you're trying to play the game without ever practicing the motion. And if you want to grow this year, stop hoping hoping to be the star shortstop and start practicing the fundamentals. Habit doesn't get in the way of relationship. Habit empowers relationship. Lane really has done a great job with Ava. I would not coach our boys until they were at least nine years old because I do not have the patience to teach those kind of fundamentals. I let someone else do that teaching. I like to come into the part where I get to play catch with my kids. It takes the little stuff, the habits, to create the relationship. So what does that look like in practicality? So there's a thing that you expect the preacher to say. I'm going to go ahead and say it even though it's cliche. Uh, You want to grow in your faith in 2020? Read your Bible, pray every day. Okay, but I've tried that, and it doesn't work for me. The reason that people like me tell everybody to read your Bible and pray regularly is because over and over again, when you ask people, do they feel like they've grown in their discipleship, the two leading factors for people saying yes to that are if they are in the Word daily and regularly praying. You say, okay, but I've tried it, and it didn't work. So I would suggest begin to create habits. What does it take to be in the Word daily? Some of us are readers. If you love to read, I'd love to see just, how many of you love to read? All right, that's a decent amount. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you don't love to read. I'm just going to assume as everybody didn't raise your hand. Reading doesn't work for you, does it? You can create habits that do not involve you sitting still and trying to focus on a page. For some of us, that's just a challenge by itself. You know what I have learned? I've learned I enjoy being in the Word way more when I'm moving. So I listen to the Bible now. I get in the Bible app and I'll go on a walk. Or I'll be doing housework around the house or whatever, and I'll say, today, I'm going to absorb this chapter of the Bible through my ears, not through my eyes. I spend time in the Word because that is a way to tweak it in a way that now works for me better. I'm creating a new habit. For some of us, the biggest challenge thing that stands in our way is just time. And so maybe for you, it's not saying, this year, I'm really going to read the Bible. It's, hey, for the first month of the year, I'm going to take five minutes a day and just be still. Okay, five minutes is probably too long. (laughs) Maybe one minute. But just create the basic part of the habit. Break it down and start from there. If you want the relationship with God, create the habits. Maybe it's something bigger for you. Maybe it's not to read your Bible, pray every day. You're like, I do that. I'm still stuck. Because the part that I can't get my head around is forgiveness. What does it mean to break forgiveness down to its component elements and to make the practices of the smallest parts? Or contentedness? or joy. All of these things are learned behaviors. Jesus didn't say to his disciples, follow me and it will magically happen. He said, follow me and I will teach you how to be like this. Third thing we can do to become the people that God wants us to be in 2020 is this. Don't worry about being good enough. For some of you, I know that when I talk about this stuff, what it feels like is that I'm stomping on old wounds. That you say, we were raised at a time when what we were told was we got to work our way to heaven. Do it right or God will not be happy with you. Can I give you a word of encouragement? You're not making these habits to, to do everything right so God will love you. You're making these habits so that you can be in a relationship with God who already loves you has already done everything he needs to do to show you that love and is inviting you into relationship with him. If you need any more encouragement, let me give you just one word from Scripture. Every single one of the apostles that followed Jesus around for three years abandoned him. Every single one of them deserted him in his moment of need. You say, I'm not sure I can ever get this right, and I would say neither did the disciples. So if you fail Jesus, you're in pretty good company. Because Jesus turned around and forgave them. This is from John 21. This is Jesus after the resurrection. The men are out fishing on the, on the lake, and he comes, and he's now on the shore, and he calls them. And Peter recognizes it's Jesus, dives in the water and swims over, and Jesus is sitting there cooking them breakfast. He said, now come and have some breakfast. 
Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked the question a third time. Why? Because Peter had denied Jesus three times. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Now, come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. Oh, this reset for me. There we go, sorry. I tell you the truth, he said. When you were young, you'll be able to, you were able to do as you like. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, say it with me, follow me. Jesus' call to follow is not a one-time only call, and it's not only as long as you're good enough, and it's not only as long as you do it right for long enough. Jesus' call is to follow me, to learn, to succeed, to fail, to, to ask for forgiveness, to be forgiven again, even when confessing the need for forgiveness hurts. Jesus says, I have not given up on you. The call for the beginner is the same for the call of the veteran. Follow me again. I love you, I will forgive you. Work on being more like me. Not to be forgiven, but because you're forgiven. Not to be loved, but because you're loved. Do you want to grow in 2020 into the person that God is calling you to be more and more into the goodness and love of Christ? Then I would suggest, you do not have to waste your time wondering, am I good enough? But instead, say, how do I follow the one who loves me enough to forgive when I'm not good enough? Finally, say yes to the adventure. Say yes to Jesus again. In 2020, say yes to Jesus again and again and again and again. Some of us said yes to Jesus a long time ago. And then we waited for the magic to happen and we wondered why it didn't. And then we've been coasting. Some of us said yes to Jesus long ago and then returned to those sins and those failures and got stuck. Some of us said yes to Jesus long ago and now walk around with so much guilt and shame we're not sure the call was ever real in the first place. I want to invite you this morning, say yes to Jesus. Let's begin making habits together as a church, and I'm going to help you do so in the weeks to come. But let's build the kind of habits that will help us become more like Jesus. Let's stop worrying about whether we're good enough. We're not, but Jesus is good enough. And then at the end of that recognition, let's say yes to Jesus again. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what saying yes to Jesus looks like for you. For some of us, it's just re-upping and saying, I'm I'm still in. Jesus, I'm still in. I'm ready to to take it to the next level. For some of us, it's starting. It's that first place where he's calling, and you've been saying, I've been listening, but I haven't been saying yes yet. Are you ready to follow? Whatever that looks like in 2020, we are ready to follow alongside you. If we can love you, if we can pray for you, serve you, or just show you that you have a partner in the journey, if we can help you take your next step of faith, we would love to do that journey with you. You can respond now as we stand and as we sing.
on your own by yourself to become more like him in 2020. Jesus left the church two huge gifts. Left his disciples two huge gifts when he ascended. He left them, first of all, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Second of all, the church. We journey together and we journey in fellowship with God himself working within us. I have seen both things break out among this church and see people's lives reshaped by the Holy Spirit and by fellowship with one another. You do not enter 2020 alone. You enter it with God on your side and the church on your side. And what can stand against that? Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, thank you for inviting us into fellowship with you. Thank you for loving us enough to call us, to say, follow me. Thank you for showing so many of us the joys of being Jesus followers. God, we, like the disciples, confess that we have deserted at times, that we have betrayed you at times, that we have not been true to the teachings of Jesus at times. Sometimes it has been out of willful disobedience. Sometimes it is out of ignorance in God. Sometimes it's just out of apathy. But God, we want more. We want more of you. We want more of participation in the kingdom of God. And we want to be your hands and feet in the world. God, as we enter into a new year, into a new decade, I ask that you would continue to make us new. May we be the people that our brothers and sisters in this church need. May we be the people that our community needs. May we be the people that you are calling us to become. Through the power of your Holy Spirit and the power of the church surrounding each other. May it be so. I ask in the name of the one who gave us this call to begin with, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go and follow Jesus this week. You're dismissed.